Uh, as much as slavery is repudiated around the world today, prior to the 18th century, I know of no serious effort to abolish the institution anywhere. I know of no serious effort to abolish the institution anywhere. I know of no serious effort to abolish the institution anywhere. I know of no serious effort to abolish the institution anywhere. 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 Not in Africa, not in, not oh, in the Arabian Not world. in Africa in the 21st century. Mm. Uh, when Adam Smith wrote in 1776 that the only place in the world where slavery had been abolished completely was Western Europe. That the only place in the world where slavery had been abolished completely was Western Europe. That the only place in the world where slavery had been abolished completely was Western Europe. That the only place in the world where slavery had been abolished completely was Western Europe. Slavery was destroyed within the United States at staggering costs in blood and treasure, but the struggle was over within a few ghastly years of warfare. Nevertheless, the Civil War was the bloodiest war ever fought in the Western Hemisphere, and more Americans were killed in that war than in any other war in the country's history. But this was a highly atypical, indeed unique, way to end slavery. In most of the rest of the world, unremitting efforts to destroy the institution of slavery went on for more than a century, on a thousand shifting fronts, and in the face of determined and ingenious efforts to continue the trade in human beings. Within the British Empire, the abolition of slavery was accompanied by the payment of compensation to slave owners for what was legally the confiscation of their property. This cost the British government 20 million pounds, a huge sum in the 19th century, about 5% of the nation's annual output. Within the British Empire, the abolition of slavery was accompanied by the payment of compensation to slave owners for what was legally the confiscation of their property. This cost the British government 20 million pounds, a huge sum in the 19th century, about 5% of the nation's annual output. Within the British Empire, the abolition of slavery was accompanied by the payment of compensation to slave owners for what was legally the confiscation of their property. This cost the British government 20 million pounds, a huge sum in the 19th century, about 5% of the nation's annual output. Within the British Empire, the abolition of slavery was accompanied by the payment of compensation to slave owners for what was legally the confiscation of their property. This cost the British government 20 million pounds, a huge sum in the 19th century, about 5% of the nation's annual output. This notably came at an incredible cost to the British Treasury since they opted to pay the slave owners for their lost revenues. In fact, the British government got into so much debt for this that the loan taken out by Prime Minister Viscount Melbourne wasn't paid off until the premiership of David Cameron in 2015. While the British could simply abolish slavery in their Western Hemisphere colonies, they faced a more daunting and longer-lasting task of patrolling the Atlantic off the coast of Africa in order to prevent slave ships of various nationalities from continuing to supply slaves illegally. Even during the Napoleonic Wars, Britain continued to keep some of its warships on patrol off West Africa. Moreover, such patrols likewise tried to interdict the shipments of slaves from East Africa through the Indian Ocean the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf. Brazil capitulated to British demands that it end its slave trade after being publicly humiliated by British warships that seized and destroyed slave ships within Brazil's own waters. In 1873, two British cruisers appeared off the coast of Zanzibar and threatened to blockade the island unless the slave market there shut down. It was shut down it would be hard to think of any other crusade pursued so relentlessly for so long by any nation at such mounting costs without any economic or other tangible benefit to itself. It would be hard to think of any other crusade pursued so relentlessly for so long by any nation at such mounting costs without any economic or other tangible benefit to itself. It would be hard to think of any other crusade pursued so relentlessly for so long by any nation at such mounting costs without any economic or other tangible benefit to itself.
It would be hard to think of any other crusade pursued so relentlessly for so long by any nation at such mounting costs without any economic or other tangible benefit to itself. These costs included bribes paid to Spain and Portugal to get their cooperation with the effort to stop the international slave trade, and the costs of maintaining naval patrols and of resettling freed slaves, not to mention dangerous frictions with France and the United States, among other countries. Captains of British warships who detained vessels suspected of carrying slaves were legally liable if those vessels turned out to have no slaves on board. The human costs were also large. The heavy drain, physical and mental, in keeping squadrons on the East African coast was reflected in the loss of 282 officers and men in the 10 years 1875 to 1885. And this did not include those invalidated home. Naval personnel, racked by fever, sunstroke, and dysentery, were forced to retire prematurely and live on a small pittance. The cost of upkeep of the squadron over the 20 years prior to 1890 was estimated at 4 million sterling, and this did not take into account the large amount of work imposed on consular and judicial staff in Zanzibar in trying cases and dealing with reports, etc. Even so, the results were slow in coming. More streamlined slave ships were designed in hopes of being able to outrun the ships of the Royal Navy in the Atlantic. Nevertheless, the dogged persistence of the British eventually reduced the shipment of slaves across the Atlantic and across the waters of the Islamic world. Although the French flag was for many years widely used as protection from the boarding of ships on the high seas by the British Navy, even by slave traders who were neither French nor authorized to fly the French flag, eventually France itself turned against slavery outlawed the institution, and sent some of its own warships to patrol the Atlantic off the coast of Africa to intercept and deter the shipment of slaves to the Western Hemisphere. The American flag was likewise so used, and the United States, like France, eventually turned against the slave trade and sent warships to join the Atlantic patrols to interdict slave shipments. Although by 1860 the Atlantic slave trade had been effectively stopped, the slave trade from East Africa across the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf took longer to be reduced significantly. Off the east coast of Africa, smaller Arab vessels called dhows hugged the coastlines in waters too shallow for the British warships to enter. One British commodore estimated that he captured one dhow for every eight that escaped. Nevertheless, during the period from 1866 to 1869, 129 slave vessels were captured and 3,380 slaves were freed. When the threat of being boarded seemed imminent, the Arabs would throw slaves overboard to drown rather than have them be found on board, which could lead to British seizure of the vessel and punishment of those who manned it. The worst that could befall the slaves was when the slaver was overhauled by a British cruiser, and they might then be flung overboard to dispose of all evidence. Devereux mentions a case where the Arabs, when pursued by an English cruiser, cut the throats of 24 slaves and threw them overboard. Colombe also states that Arabs would not hesitate to knock slaves on the head and throw them overboard to avoid capture. Because there were only a few naval ships available to cover a vast expanse of water in this region, British warships would often launch smaller boats to engage the Arab slave dows. In these cases, as one study put it, the slave traffickers frequently did not hesitate to attack boat crews in defense of their profits. Battles between the Arabs' vessels and the smaller British craft were especially likely when the larger ships that launched them were too far away to reach the scene in time to join the battle. In other cases, the Arabs fled even from the smaller British vessels. An episode in 1866 was typical. On 26 April 1866, the Penguin set out after a dhow and fired several shots in an effort to make the crew come to. When the dhow failed to lower its sail, Gartorth felt certain that she was a slaver and ceased firing for the sake of the slaves on board. However, he managed to close with the dhow, which then made for the rocks through a heavy surf. By the time the ship's boats could be lowered to follow, the Arab crew had fled but the pounding surf made any attempt by the slavers to salvage the human cargo too dangerous. To their horror, 
the boat crew found that they too could not reach the dhow, which was rapidly filling with water, drowning the slaves. The boat officer decided that he could not risk coming in close to the dhow, but several of the crewmen of the cutter recklessly dived in and swam through the surf to the dhow. In a remarkable display of courage, the sailors managed to bring 28 of the slaves back to the boat. But the dhow appeared to have had more than 200 slaves on board, and most died in the pounding waves. In another episode, the Arabs' ruthlessness toward the slaves was further revealed. When the Daphne's cutter captured a dhow with 156 slaves on board, many were found to be in the final stages of starvation and dysentery. One woman was brought out of the dhow with a month-old infant in her arms. The baby's forehead was crushed, and when she was asked how the injury had happened, she explained to the ship's interpreter that as the boat came alongside, the baby began to cry. One of the dhowmen, fearing that the sailors would hear the cries, picked up a stone and crushed the child's head. One of the dhowmen, fearing that the sailors would hear the cries, picked up a stone and crushed the child's head. One of the dhowmen, fearing that the sailors would hear the cries, picked up a stone and crushed the child's head. One of the dhowmen, fearing that the sailors would hear the cries, picked up a stone and crushed the child's head. One of the dhowmen, fearing that the sailors would hear the cries, picked up a stone and crushed the child's head. This was not a unique act. British missionary and explorer David Livingstone related a similar incident on land. One woman, who was unable to carry both her load and young child, had the child taken from her and saw its brains dashed out on a stone. Had the child taken from her and saw its brains dashed out on a stone. Had the child taken from her and saw its brains dashed out on a stone. Had the child taken from her and saw its brains dashed out on a stone. Had the child taken from her and saw its brains dashed out on a stone. Dr. Livingstone also reported having nightmares for weeks after encountering Arab slave traders and their victims. Not only was this Christian missionary shocked by the brutality of the Arab slave traders, so was Muhammad Ali, the ruler of Egypt, who was a battle-hardened military commander. None of this means that the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade should be ignored, downplayed, or excused, nor have they been. A vast literature has detailed the vile conditions under which slaves from Africa lived and died during their voyages to the Western Hemisphere. But the much less publicized slave trade to the Islamic countries had even higher mortality rates en route, as well as involving larger numbers of people over the centuries, even though the Atlantic slave trade had higher peaks while it lasted. By a variety of accounts, most of the slaves who were marched across the Sahara toward the Mediterranean died on the way. While these were mostly women and girls, the males faced a special danger, castration to produce the eunuchs in demand as harem attendants in the Islamic world. Because castration was forbidden by Islamic law, the operation tended to be performed usually crudely, in the hinterlands, before the slave caravans reached places within the effective control of the Ottoman Empire. The great majority of those operated on died as a result. But the price of eunuchs was so much higher than the price of other slaves that the practice was still profitable on net balance. The British Governor General of the Sudan, C.G. Gordon, estimated that between 1875 and 1879, from 80,000 to 100,000 slaves were exported through his region. General Gordon imposed the death penalty on those convicted of castrating slave men to market them as eunuchs. His attempt to stamp out slave trading in the Sudan cost him his own life as an opposing army, raised and led by Muhammad Mahad, defeated his troops at Khartoum in 1885, and killed Gordon, after which the slave trade flourished again. British control in the region was firmly re-established in 1898 by the crushing victory of troops led by Lord Kitchener at Omdurman, and including a young officer named Winston Churchill. On the issue of slavery, it was essentially Western civilization against the world. On the issue of slavery, it was essentially Western civilization against the world. On the issue of slavery, it was essentially Western civilization against the world. On the issue of slavery, it was essentially Western civilization 
against the world. At the time, Western civilization had the power to prevail against all other civilizations. That is how and why slavery was destroyed as an institution in almost the whole world. But it did not happen all at once or even within a few decades. When the British finally stamped out slavery in Tanganyika in 1922, it was more than half a century after the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States, and vestiges of slavery still survived in parts of Africa into the 21st century. The British stamped out slavery, not only throughout the British Empire, which included one-fourth of the world, whether measured in land or people, but also by its pressures and its actions against other nations. For example, the British Navy entered Brazilian waters in 1849 and destroyed Brazilian ships that had been used in the slave trade. The British government pressured the Ottoman Empire into banning the African slave trade and, later, threatened to start boarding Ottoman ships in the Mediterranean if that empire did not do a better job of policing the ban. Still later, Americans stamped out slavery in the Philippines, the Dutch stamped it out in Indonesia, the Russians in Central Asia, the French in their West African and Caribbean colonies. Germans, in their East Africa colonies, often hanged slave traders on the spot when they caught them in the act. No non-Western nation or civilization shared this animosity towards slavery that began to develop in the Western world in the late 18th century, reached its peak in the 19th century, and continued to fuel the anti-slavery efforts that were still necessary in much of Africa and the Middle East on into the first half of the 20th century. This worldwide struggle went on for more than a century because the non-Western world in general resisted and evaded all efforts to get them to root out this institution that was an integral part of their economies and societies. When the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire first raised the issue of abolishing slavery with the Sultan in 1840, he reported this response. I have been heard with extreme astonishment, accompanied with a smile at a proposition for destroying an institution closely interwoven with the frame of society in this country, and intimately connected with the law and with the habits and even the religion of all classes, from the Sultan himself on down to the lowest peasant. Similarly, the Maoris of New Zealand responded to comments on their enslavement of some fellow Polynesians on other islands by saying, We took possession in accordance with our customs, and we caught all the people. Not one escaped. Some ran away from us. These we killed, and others we killed. But what of that? It was in accordance with our customs. When British Foreign Secretary Palmerston sought in 1841, through his representative council, Atkins Hamilton, to get the ruler of Zanzibar to end the flourishing slave trade there, this was the response. When Palmerston continued to press for an end to the slave trade, Said pleaded that if he acceded to British demands, his subjects would withdraw their loyalty from him and support another claimant to the throne. And was he not looked up to by all Arabs generally as the person who should protect and guarantee for them their dearest interests, the right to carry on the slave trade? He reminded Hamilton that Arabs were not like the English and other European people who were always reading and writing and were unable to understand the anti-slavery viewpoint. The British obsession with it was quite inexplicable to them. In short, what was so patently wrong about slavery in the eyes of Western civilization of the past two centuries was almost incomprehensible to many non-Westerners. Eventually, some westernized elites or intellectuals in non-Western societies also became embarrassed about slavery, but these societies developed no such fervent anti-slavery movements as those which propelled successive European and European offshoot societies to ban this practice for themselves and to stamp it out, among others. Here was the scene when the Ottoman Empire announced the end of the slave trade. In 1855, when the Sultan's Furman was read out in Mecca and Jeddah, it caused a revolution. Turkish officials, including the Qadi, who read the Furman, were murdered, the garrison shut, and Mecca was in a state of revolt until the port repealed the obnoxious order. And when the governor-general of the Hejaz issued orders on 25th February 1860 forbidding the slave trade in all Turkish ports in the Red Sea, there was great excitement and fear of the recurrence of the 1855 violence. There was no Ottoman cruiser in the Red Sea capable of giving effect to this order, and Turkish officials were too frightened 
to enforce it. Although the slave trade was formally abolished in the Ottoman Empire, under pressure from the British government, slavery itself continued. As of 1891, the Imperial Palace purchased 11 slave girls for its harem, as others in the Ottoman Empire purchased women as concubines, typically white women from a region near the Caucasus and the Black Sea, known as Circassia, even though every nation in the Western world had by then outlawed slavery. Not only the Turks accepted such slavery, so did the Circassians. Mothers often groomed their daughters for this role and sold them into what was considered to be a desirable situation, at least by comparison with what was available in Circassia. British Foreign Secretary Palmerston said, The only complaint we have ever heard from the Circassians has been against our attempts to stop the traffic. Contrary to the myths to live by, created by Alex Haley and others, Africans were by no means the innocents portrayed in roots, baffled as to why white men were coming in and taking their people away in chains. On the contrary, the region of West Africa from which Kunta Kinte supposedly came was one of the great slave-trading regions of the continent, before, during, and after the white man arrived. The region of West Africa from which Kunta Kinte supposedly came was one of the great slave-trading regions of the continent, before, during, and after the white man arrived. The region of West Africa from which Kunta Kinte supposedly came was one of the great slave-trading regions of the continent, before, during, and after the white man arrived. It was Africans who enslaved their fellow Africans, selling some of these slaves to Europeans or to Arabs and keeping others for themselves. Even at the peak of the Atlantic slave trade, Africans retained more slaves for themselves than they sent to the Western Hemisphere. While for Africa and the Middle East, the term was the decline of slavery a much more uneven and protracted process in which local peoples continued the practice whenever and wherever they could escape the scrutiny or the power of European imperial authorities. This was possible only because the anti-slavery movement coincided with an era in which Western power and hegemony were at their zenith, so that it was essentially European imperialism which ended slavery. This idea might seem shocking, not because it does not fit the facts, but because it does not fit the prevailing vision of our time.